Delve into the chilling depths of human psychology as we unveil the seventh installment of Unfamous Serial Killers, Obscure Tales of Infamy. In this riveting episode, we uncover the haunting stories of 13 lesser-known serial killers whose gruesome deeds have often been overshadowed by more infamous cases. From hidden motives to bizarre methodologies, join us as we shed light on the dark corners of history that harbor these twisted narratives. With in-depth research and meticulous storytelling, we bring you face to face with the macabre, shedding light on the inexplicable actions that forever stain these individuals' names. Tune into Part 7 and explore the enigmatic minds and nefarious actions of those who lurked in the shadows, leaving behind a trail of terror that history can't forget. Sir He to Catch Sir He to Catch, also known as the Poligovsky Maniac, is a Ukrainian serial killer who was convicted of killing 37 women and girls in Ukraine from 1980 to 2005. Serhii Fedorovic Tkach, also spelled Sergei, was born on September 12, 1952, in Kislyovsk, Russian SFSR, Soviet Union, and is known to have served in the Soviet Army, claiming to neighbors he was a veteran of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. To catch was a police investigator in Kemerova Oblast and was recommended for admission to a Ministry of Internal Affairs school until he was found to have falsified evidence and was forced to resign. After this to catch worked in different jobs before he moved to the Ukraine SSR in 1982 where he began to work as a police criminal investigator in the Dnipropetrovsk region. In 1984 young women began to disappear across Kharkiv Oblast, Zaporizhia Oblast, Dnipropetrovsk and Crimea in eastern Ukraine near to catch his home and work. He would target female victims aged between 8 and 18 whom he would rape and suffocate. After death, he would perform necrophilic acts on their bodies. To catch would use his police knowledge to mislead investigators, such as choosing victims near railway lines that had recently been treated with tar in order to throw sniffer dogs off the scene. In August 2005, to catch went to the funeral of one of his victims. Other children attending claimed to have seen to catch with the victim shortly before she died and to catch was arrested at his home in Palahi. He admitted to his crimes, claiming to have killed over 100 people and demanding the death penalty. After a trial that lasted a year, in 2008 to catch was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of 37 women and girls over two decades. Over the years 15 men had been wrongly imprisoned for some of the murders to catch was found guilty of, one of whom committed suicide, and another wasn't released until March 2012. Ansys Coppens was a Latvian robber turned serial killer. He was born in 1985 in Platon Parish and at the age of 21 began to serve in the Imperial Russian Army before transferring to the Red Army's 9th Latvian Regiment. He deserted in 1919 to 1920 and returned to Latvia. There, he began to commit robberies, his first was on January 29, 1920 and the last was on May 29, 1926. During this six-year period Coppens committed over 30 robberies and 19 murders. At the same time he worked as a paper hanger in Jelgava. He robbed a passenger train in September 1923, but most often committed highway robberies. Coppens was arrested on June 8, 1926 and was sentenced to death. He was executed by hanging on May 6, 1927, and was buried in Steep Parish. El Cicapata, or the Psychopath, is an unidentified serial killer in Costa Rica. They are responsible for the murders of 19 people between 1986 and 1996 in Cartago, Curitabat and Desamparados, called the Triangle of Death. The statute of limitations for their crimes has expired, so if a suspect is ever captured, no charges can be filed. The victims were single women or couples who were attacked at night in desolate areas. A composite image was created, although nobody has been identified as a result. The profile indicates that the killer is a male of Costa Rican origin who lived in Nicaragua. The murderer was believed to be in their mid-40s in 1996, and a possible Nicaraguan guerrilla. One rumor was that the killer could be part of one of the most powerful families in Costa Rica, the family of former President José Figueres Ferrer, and that they were protected as a result. Police believe the suspect had undergone some psychological trauma in their youth, related to their mother or a companion, hence the cruelty displayed to women. Police said that there was no forensic evidence linking the crimes to a specific suspect. 
On June 14, 1987, Legia Camacho Bermudez was reading in bed when she was shot from outside her house, dying immediately. This contradicts the modus operandi of Elsa Capata, but the crime is linked to the others through ballistics. Fingerprints were found, but as no suspect has been arrested, no comparison has been made. The last suspected crime of the killer occurred on October 26, 1996. Mauricio Cordero and Ileana Alvarez were in their car when a stranger forced them to get out and walk 500m before shooting them both. While nobody was ever caught for this crime, the police linked the modus operandi to the murders of 19 other people between 1986 and 1996. The killer is at large to this day. Jose Paz Bezerra, also known as the Morumbi Monster, is a Brazilian serial killer. He is responsible for the murders of over 20 women in Sao Paulo and Para and received a sentence of more than 60 years. He served the maximum sentence allowed in Brazil, 30 years, and was released in 2001. Bezerra's crimes occurred in the 1960s slash 1970s. They were cold and brutal, with victims left bound and gagged, naked, tied up with pieces of their own clothing. Each body showed signs of sexual violence. Experts claim that Bezerra became a serial killer because he had a troubled childhood, having to take care of his father from an early age. His father suffered from leprosy, and Bezerra had to sanitize and remove the necrotic parts of the lesions he suffered with. His mother was a prostitute who would take Jose to watch her having sex with clients, this caused him to hate her. Autopsies of Bezerra's victims indicated that the Morumbi monster was looking for women who looked like his mother. Francisco Guerrero Perez, also known as El Calacaro, in reference to the vest he always wore, was a 19th century Mexican serial killer. He killed around 20 prostitutes in Mexico City between 1880 and 1888, as well as one woman who may or may not have been a sex worker. He was a contemporary of Jack the Ripper, who was operating in London at the same time. With the 11th child of a family riddled by poverty and abuse, he moved from Baggio to Mexico City at the age of 22, where he worked for a shoemaker. He was known for dressing extravagantly, with cashmere pants, a charro vest and a charro jacket. A source described him as, handsome, elegant, flirtatious and quarrelsome. Carrero was considered a psychopath who used people and had an inflated ego. He was charismatic, in prison, he was described by others as, a silent and quiet person, he cares about his appearance. He once wrote a letter to the warden asking for his family to bring him new pants so he could dress according to his education. Carrero viewed females as a disposable conduit to sexual gratification. His crime showed great hatred, extreme cruelty and sexual mutilations. He violated his victims to demonstrate his power, choosing prostitutes not because of their job, but simply their vulnerability. According to Guerrero himself, women had a duty to be faithful to their men, and female adultery should be punished with the death penalty. Mikhail Novosilov, also known as the Necrophile Rebel, is a Soviet Tajik serial killer who murdered 22 people in Russia and 6 in Tajikistan. Born in Serapol, Novosilov has been sentenced three times in all. The first prison sentence was 17 years, due to a fight where he wounded two men with a knife. After being released, Novosilov met up with a prostitute who ridiculed his sexual impotence, this caused him to stop trusting women. His first murder was committed in Tchaikovsky, Perm Cry. The victim was a girl picked at random. Fearing arrest, Novosilov ran, but returned a few hours later to commit sexual acts with the body. He became a master of disguise, often appearing as trusted professionals in various fields to lure his victims. He killed with a blow to the head with any heavy object before choking the victims and violating their corpses. The exception was a double murder, he lured a boy and girl with a promise of candy. The boy was killed with a sharp electrode hidden under the saddle of Novosilov's bike, the bodies were thrown in an aqueduct. Novosilov did not come under scrutiny by authorities for a long time, since he committed his crimes in different areas. He also had three passports with different names, allowing him to impersonate others. 
After the announcement of a Russia white search, Novoselov fled to Tajikistan and began working in a psychiatric hospital in Dushanbe. He was arrested by chance trying to steal an air rifle in the central park of Dushanbe. He was placed in the pretrial detention center and charged with theft. A few days later it was revealed that he was being investigated for three rape-slash-murders and nine attempts to rape minors. During interrogation, Novoselov confessed to three more murders in Tajikistan, as well as 16 in Russia. He was found to be insane and committed for the rest of his natural life. Shine Jun was a Chinese robber-slash-serial killer who, in a seven-year spree, robbed 22 stores in Chongqing, Hunan, Hubei, Yunnan and Guangxi, killing 28 people and wounding 23. It is believed the total amount stolen was 5.36 million yuan, 613,000 pounds. Born in 1966 to a poor family, the youngest of seven brothers, Shan Jun dropped out of school in his first year of high school. In 1989 he was arrested and sentenced to reformation through labor. On December 22, 1995, Shan robbed the Chongqing Friendship Store, killing one person and stealing jewelry worth 455,000 yuan, 52,000 pounds. Almost a year later, Sean robbed Shanghai's first department store, stealing jewelry worth over 630,000 yuan, 72,000 pounds. In November 1997, Sean robbed Changsha Friendship Mall, killing two people and stealing jewelry worth 1.372 million yuan, 150,600 pounds. His next attack was on December 20, 1998, where he raided a public security checkpoint, killing two people. Two weeks later, Sean robbed the jewelry cabinet of Wuhan Square, killing one person and stealing 30,000 yuan, 3,400 pounds, and 2.634 million yuan's worth of gold jewelry, worth approximately 300,000 pounds. On August 15, 2000, Sean Jun daringly robbed the president of the Agricultural Bank of Anshan County, killing two people and stealing 16,000 yuan, around 1,800 pounds. Less than three weeks later, he robbed a cash truck in Changda, killing seven people, stealing two small submachine guns and 20 bullets. Prior to this crime spree, in 1993, Shang Jun and his accomplice Lu Bao Gang went to Anshan County to commit a robbery. The robbery was unsuccessful, Shang accidentally injured Lu. In order to evade capture, Shang killed Lu with a hammer and disposed of his body. After that he couldn't escape to Guangxi and killed a Hubei businessman before the Spring Festival. Shortly after, he met a mistress in Guangxi and borrowed money from her to buy a gun. He lured two escorts to a mountain where he killed them both, he wanted to practice committing murders quickly. On September 19, 2000, Chongqing police issued a warrant for the arrest of Shang Jun. It is reported that he had a grenade on him at the time. At trial, on April 14, 2001, Shang Jun was sentenced to death by the First Intermediate People's Court of Chongqing for intentional homicide and robbery, and deprived of political rights for life. He was executed in Chongqing on May 20, 2001. Clementine Barnabet, born in 1894 in St. Martinville, Louisiana, was a convicted murderer. She was born to parents Raymond Barnabet and Nina Porter and had a brother, Zephyrin. It is reported that Barnabet's father abused his family, leading to them moving to Lafayette in 1909. Not much is known about Barnabet's killings, but they were consistent, she murdered entire families with an axe, often cutting off their heads. The first murder was committed in February 1911. Clementine's father, Raymond, was arrested and awaited trial, but then another family was slaughtered. In November 1911, Norbert and Asimo Randall and their four children were murdered in the same way. Clementine Barnabet eventually confessed to 35 murders, explaining that she attended the Church of Sacrifice, an offshoot of a Christ-sanctified Holy Church congregation in Lake Charles, Louisiana. She claimed that a priestess gave her and her friends conjure bags that would grant them power, making them undetectable by the authorities. This encouraged Barnabet to commit her first murder, to test whether or not this was true. At just 18 years old, in October 1912, Clementine Barnabet was sentenced to life in prison at Angola State Penitentiary. In July 1913 she attempted to escape but was caught. 
She was released in August 1923, and nothing has been heard about her since. Luis Gregorio Ramirez Maestre, also known as the Monster of Tenerife, is a Colombian serial killer with 30 victims. His victims were motorcycle taxi drivers between the ages of 19 to 30 who weren't very tall and didn't weigh much, and were therefore easy to victimize. He used his charm to make his victims trust him before asking them to drive him to a deserted location, where he grabbed them by the throat and suffocated them into unconsciousness. Most of Ramirez Maestre's victims were tortured and then suffocated, before being hung from trees by their wrists, waist and ankles. This would cause their own body weight to kill them over the course of several days. The killer would make sure to wait and watch his victims slow, painful deaths. Police confirmed that Ramirez Maestre kept trophies from his victims, such as wallets, mobiles, and credit cards. After the body of one victim, John Hiro Amador, was discovered, wrapped in ropes, Ramirez Maestre confessed. Experts consider him to be a psychopath. In 2012, Ramirez Maestre was captured and was eventually found guilty of several murders. He received 57 years in prison, later lowered to 34 years for acceptance of charges. He will be released from prison in 2032 after serving 20 years, in accordance with Colombian law. Billy Richard Glaze, also known as Jesse Sitting Crow and Butcher Knife Billy was a convicted serial killer whose guilt has been questioned since the discovery of DNA evidence which excluded Glaze and implicated another man. He was suspected of murdering at least 50 women, and boasted to police about having killed more than 20. However, in later interviews, Glaze claimed to be innocent. He was first named a suspect in the 1986-87 murders of three Native American women in Minneapolis a waitress gave the authorities his name. Information provided by a girlfriend led investigators to seek him in New Mexico and he was arrested driving under the influence on August 31, 1987, for a parole violation from a Texas rape conviction in 1974. Arresting officers discovered a bloody shirt, a crowbar and a nightstick in Glaze's truck. Hair samples from the crowbar were what convicted him of three counts of first-degree murder, with parole eligibility 52 years later. At sentencing, Glaze maintained his innocence. In 2009, the Innocence Project conducted DNA testing on a victim's rape kit. It didn't match Glaze, but did match another Minnesota man, a convicted rapist. More testing in 2014, conducted on a cigarette but found near the body of another victim, was a match to the same man. Despite dozens of tests of many pieces of evidence from the three crime scenes, none were a match for Glaze. Glaze's attorneys filed a motion for a retrial on the basis of both the DNA results and unreliable eyewitnesses, one of whom had since recanted and another who had claimed to have witnessed over 60 murders during his time in prison. In response to this, the Minneapolis Police Department and the Hennepin County Attorney's Office are reinvestigating the case. On December 22, 2015, Billy Glaze died at the age of 72, with stage 4 lung cancer. Mita Trobek was a Slovenian serial killer, born in Planine and Nad Horjulam on June 6, 1948, as an illegitimate child. Not much is known about his early years, but it is known that at the age of 14 he burned his neighbor's hay, and at 18 Trobek stole a moped. Following his military service he worked for Yugoslav Railways before emigrating to Germany. Trobek returned to Slovenia in 1974, where he committed several crimes, landing him in prison for 13 months. Between 1976 to 1978 Trobek raped, killed and cremated at least five women. As a result, he was sentenced to death, the last death sentence in Slovenia. His sentence was later commuted to 20 years in prison. During his time in prison Trobek tried to kill fellow prisoners twice and received 15 years extra on his sentence. He committed suicide at Dob Pri Murni Prison in Slovenskavas on May 20, 2006, and was buried in an anonymous grave in St. Rupert. At the time of his death he was suffering with prostate cancer and had been a prisoner for 27 years a Slovenian record. Shou Kawa was a Chinese gunman who was suspected of murder and robbery. The Chinese media reported that he is involved in at least nine murder and robbery cases, and was therefore classified as an A-level wanted criminal of the Ministry of Public Security. 
He was born on February 6, 1970, in Jinko Town, Shaping the District, Chongqing. In 1985, at just 15 years old, Zhou was jailed for two weeks on molestation charges. He was again jailed for arms trafficking in 2005. In 1991, Zhou stole a shotgun in Chongqing and two years later was arrested and sentenced to re-education through labor for illegal possession of firearms. In 1997 he bought a Type 54 pistol near the border of China and Burma in Yunnan province. He is suspected to have murdered 10 people and robbed millions of yuan in Jiangsu, Hunan and Chongqing between 2004 and 2012. According to Changsha police, Zhou was a mercenary solider in Burma until 2004, explaining his comfort with guns. Following a huge manhunt, Zhou Kawa was shot and killed by police on August 14, 2012. Charles Ray Hatcher was an American serial killer who confessed to the murders of 16 people over a 14-year period. He was born in Mound City, Missouri, on July 16, 1929, the youngest son of Jesse and Lula Hatcher. Jeshu Hatcher was an ex-convict and a violently abusive alcoholic. Hatcher was bullied as a child, and would bully his classmates in turn. In early 1935, Hatcher and his older brothers were flying a kite made with copper wire they had found in an old Model T Ford. Arthur, the oldest brother, was just about to hand the kite to Charles when it hit a high-voltage power line and electrocuted him, he was pronounced dead at the scene. Not long after this incident, Jesse left the family and divorced Lula, who remarried several times. In 1945, Hatcher moved with his mother and her third husband to St. Joseph. In 1947 Charles Hatcher was convicted of auto theft in St. Joseph after stealing a logging truck from his employers at the Iowa Missouri Walnut Company. For this, he received a two-year suspended sentence. The following year he was convicted for the same crime for stealing in 1937 Buick and was sentenced to two years in the Missouri State Penitentiary. On June 8, 1949, he was released after serving just over a year, he was back in prison within a few months, this time for forging a $10 check at a Maryville gas station. On March 18, 1951, Hatcher escaped from prison and attempted a burglary but was captured and received two extra years in prison. He was released from prison on July 14, 1954, and promptly stole a 1951 Ford in Oric. he was sentenced to four years in prison. Prior to sentencing, Hatcher tried to escape from the Ray County Jail in Richmond and received an extra two years. On March 18, 1959, Hatcher was released from prison for the sixth time. Three months later Hatcher attempted to abduct 16-year-old Stephen Pelham, a paper boy, threatening him with a butcher knife. Pelham reported the incident and Hatcher was arrested when the police pulled him over whilst he was driving a stolen vehicle. He was subsequently sentenced to five years in the Missouri State Penitentiary for the attempted kidnapping and auto theft under the Habitual Criminal Act. Whilst waiting to be transported to prison, Hatcher unsuccessfully tried to break out of the Buchanan County Jail. When he arrived at the Missouri State Penitentiary, he claimed to be the most notorious criminal in Northwest Missouri since Jesse James. On July 2, 1961, fellow inmate Jerry Farrington was found raped and stabbed to death on the prison's kitchen loading bay. Hatcher was the only kitchen crew member who was missing at the time of the murder. He was sent to solitary confinement but there was not enough evidence to convict him in court. Whilst in solitary, Hatcher wrote a note saying that he needed psychiatric treatment, but the prison psychologist believed this was just a scheme to get out of solitary and possibly to be released early. Treatment was therefore refused, and Hatcher was returned to the general population. His sentence, however, was reduced to three-quarters the original time, and he was released on August 24, 1963. Hatcher confessed to abducting 12-year-old William Freeman in Antioch, California on August 27, 1969, claiming that he told the boy to come with him, took him to a creek, and strangled him. Two days later, Gilbert Martinez, 6, was reported missing in San Francisco. The six-year-old who was playing with Martinez stated that he walked away with a man who offered him ice cream. Martinez was found by a dog walker, who saved him while he was being beaten and sexually assaulted. Police arrived on the scene and arrested the perpetrator, 
who gave his name as Albert Ralph Price, but carried ID with the name Hubbard Prater. Martinez survived his ordeal, and FBI records identified the assailant as Charles R. Hatcher. Still using the name of Albert Price, Hatcher was charged with assault with attempt to commit sodomy and kidnapping, and was ordered to complete competency evaluations to determine whether he was fit to stand trial. A complete psych evaluation was ordered when he was unresponsive during the preliminary evaluations. At this time, Hatcher claimed he was hearing voices and fake delusions and suicide attempts in an effort to avoid going to prison. In December 1970 Hatcher was sent between the courts and the hospital many times one psychiatrist diagnosed him as having a passive-aggressive personality with paraphilia and pedophilia. Hospital staff believed that Hatcher was lying about slash exaggerating the symptoms of his mental disorders. He was examined by two psychiatrists in January 1971, he was declared insane by the first, who recommended vigorous treatment in a secure hospital and the second psychiatrist declared him incompetent to stand trial and sent him back to the hospital. On May 24, 1971, Hatcher was sent to trial. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity and was sent to a different hospital for more evaluations, where he was determined to be unfit to stand trial. On June 2nd, Hatcher escaped from the hospital and was caught a week later in Calusa, California, where he was arrested for suspected auto theft under the name Richard Lee Grady. Hatcher was taken back to the California State Hospital for a mental evaluation. In April 1972 hospital staff declared his treatment unsuccessful and determined that he was a danger to other patients. As a result, he was sent to the prison state hospital in Vacaville. In August of 1972, Hatcher was transferred to San Quentin State Prison to stand trial, three years after the crime. He was ordered to undergo two final examinations, one declared him competent to stand trial and the other believed he was sane at the time of the crime. In December of that year Hatcher was tried and convicted of the abduction and molestation of Martinez. He was committed to the California State Hospital as a mentally disordered sexual offender. On March 28, 1973, guards found Hatcher hiding in a cooler near the hospital's main yard with two sheets stuffed into his pants, admitting to an escape attempt. He was sent back to court for sentencing after doctors decided he was still a threat to society. In April Hatcher was sentenced to one year to life and was sent to a medium security prison in Vacaville. In May of the same year a psychologist declared Hatcher to be a manipulative institutionalized sociopath the following month he attempted suicide by cutting his wrists after it was recommended that he be transferred to a maximum security prison. He was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and remained at Vacaville. In August 1975, at Hatcher's parole review, the guards reported good behavior. In June 1976, the California Parole Board found that Hatcher had improved during his time in prison and set a parole date of December 25, 1978. Due to the passing of a bill giving inmates credit for time spent in jails and mental hospitals, Hatcher received a new parole date of January 1977 and was released to a halfway house in San Francisco on May 20, 1977. On September 4, 1978, Hatcher, under the name Richard Clark, was arrested in Omaha, Nebraska, for sexually assaulting a 16-year-old boy. He was sent to the Douglas County Mental Hospital and was released in January 1979. On May 3, 1979, Hatcher was arrested for assault and attempted murder after trying to stab 7-year-old Thomas Morton. He was subsequently sent to Norfolk Regional Center after the charges were dropped. In May 1980, Hatcher was released from this facility but was sent back two months later following another assault he escaped in September. On October 9, 1980, Hatcher, as Richard Clark, was arrested in Lincoln, Nebraska, for the attempted assault and sodomy of a 17-year-old boy. He was then sent to another mental health facility and released 21 days later. On January 13, 1981, Hatcher was again arrested under the name Richard Clark in Des Moines, Iowa, after a knife fight. He spent time in several mental health facilities before being released to a Davenport Salvation Army shelter in April. On May 26, 1978, Eric Christgen, 4, disappeared from St. Joseph, Missouri. His body was found along the Missouri River, having been sexually abused. 
he died of suffocation. The police questioned over 100 potential suspects, including every known pervert in town, to no avail. One was 25-year-old Melvin Reynolds, a man of below-average intelligence who had been a sexual abuse victim as a child and who had homosexual experiences as an adolescent. Although Reynolds was agitated by the investigation, he fully cooperated through several interrogations including two polygraph tests and one interrogation under hypnosis. In December 1978, Reynolds was questioned under amobarbital, believed to be a truth serum, and made a vague comment that intensified suspicion against him. Two months later the police brought Reynolds in for another fount of interrogation, 14 hours of questions, threats, and promises. He finally snapped, saying, I'll say so if you want me to. In the following weeks, Reynolds embellished his confession with details that were fed to him either deliberately or otherwise. This was enough to convince the prosecutor to charge Reynolds and a jury convicted him of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. Four years later, Reynolds was released when Charles Hatcher confessed to three murder to an FBI agent including that of Eric Christgen. On July 29, 1982, Michelle Steele, 11, was reported missing in St. Joseph. The following day her uncle found her naked, brutalized body on a bank of the Missouri River. She had been severely beaten before being strangled to death. Hatcher was arrested the next day, trying to check into the St. Joseph State Hospital. Whilst awaiting trial, he confessed to 15 other child murders dating back from 1969. The first victim, 12-year-old Willem Freeman, had disappeared from Antioch, California, in August 1969, a day before Hatcher was charged with child molestation in nearby San Francisco. In a different case, Hatcher drew a map leading searcher to the remains of James Churchill on the grounds of the Rock Island Army Arsenal near Davenport, Iowa. He then confessed to the murder of Eric Christgen, for which he was convicted in October 1983, and receiving a term of life imprisonment with no parole for at least 50 years. After his second Missouri conviction a year later for the murder of Michelle Steele, Hatcher requested a death sentence but the jury refused, recommending life on December 3, 1984. Four days later, Charles Ray Hatcher hanged himself in his cell at the Missouri State Penitentiary in Jefferson City. And there you have it, Intrepid Souls, the Crim Chronicles of 13 Obscure Serial Killers who etched their names into the shadows of history. As we conclude this chilling installment of Unfamous Serial Killers, we're reminded that evil can manifest in the most unexpected of places, leaving us with questions that might never be answered. Join us again as we continue our exploration of the darkest corners of humanity, unearthing stories that deserve to be remembered, no matter how unnerving they may be. Until next time, stay vigilant and remember, the past holds secrets that can never truly be buried.